tabular data. That's what they're for. So I apologize for like the few web devs who like, totally know this and, and, and I, I, I hear you. But this is a really big deal. Laying things out with tables is a very kind of natural thing to do. You know, you can put tables inside of tables and, you know, just, just go ad nauseum with it. But it has real world implications and this is one of them. The screen reader did exactly what it was supposed to do. It said, I came across a table. I know how to read tables. You read tables left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right, all the way down. And it did that thing and it just did it wrong or rather the content creator did something wrong here in that they laid out the content visually to be read column wise but not using something sensible like CSS, like cascading style sheets, which is the more appropriate way to do it. So does that, does that make sense? All right. Only a planet. Let's just skip this paragraph. Table values. Only a planet. Blank. Blank. Table values right, at so special. Blank. Keep going a little bit. We come across this other table. Table values at special angles. Okay. Values at blank. special angles. That's that's great. Table with seven columns and six rows. Okay. So it told me a little bit of information, right? It told me there's a table. It has seven columns. It has six rows. What do we what do we have here? X. Sin X, cop cos X, column three. Okay, well those aren't really, I mean like, okay, I'm not totally stupid. Maybe I'm in a math class, I get it. Sine of X, cosine of X, but they don't read really well and there's better ways of doing that. Tan X, column four, cot X, column sec X, column. Okay, great. So let's say we want to go down secant of X. Like what are we going to get? One, row two, two, row three. Okay, well two, but like what, the secant of what is two. So now we got to navigate over here. Minus two, SQRT minus one slash SQRT three slash two, cop two slash three, column one. Okay. So two thirds. Beginning the row. Two and now I got to go back over here. So what was the answer? Because I kind of already forgotten. SQR minus one. SQR minus two. Column six. Wait, is that the right column? So now I got to go up. One. Row sec X. Top of cop. This is really painful. All right. Um, and this is really normal. So the, this is so simple to fix. All you do is you don't make the first row or the first series of data in your table, the, the row headers. You actually mark them as row headers. If you just mark them as headers, all of a sudden he'll read, and you'll see it on the next page, he'll read this correctly. And that first column down the left-hand side, mark it as headers, and he'll read it correctly. And that's a really simple way of just, all of a sudden, this whole thing becomes so much more usable to do, uh, to, to use. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, Sina is fine. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, the reason it's a fantastic question is because there's a, there's a little bit of a sub-question that you might not be asking, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put words in your mouth if I may, just a little bit, which is that, uh, is there a way to detect that the user who's using the web page is using some sort of AT, some sort of assistive technology, so we can do different stuff, right? Okay, so the idea there was the whole, going back to the whole separate but not equal thing, that's a horrendously bad idea, right? So let me, let me tell you why that's a bad idea, because it's a completely logical idea, and it's a pretty sound idea if you just look at it on surface. I wanna make this better, so I wanna detect that user and I wanna accommodate them, right? So, I mean, you're, you're definitely looking at that from a very logical point of view. The, the, ba the downside is, you'll, first of all, the answer is no. You're never gonna accurately detect that user. So that's the first thing, right? I can come up with a couple of hacks. They're not gonna work 100% of the time. So it's, it's, it's just from that perspective alone. But secondly, to do that, you're basically fragmenting your presentation all over again. For example, the fact that you're detecting browsers is sort of frowned upon even in and of itself, right? Because if you're really writing pretty good code, you should at least be able to handle like all of the Firefox, Safari, Chrome, you know, guys pretty good. And then maybe you have some IE hacks in there. I mean, everybody has to do it. But that's becoming less and less of a good idea to do this whole, we're gonna load Firefox specific code because things have a horrible way of becoming fragmented. So when you apply that concept to accessibility or to usability, uh, you get the same idea. So you might do really great for the JAWS user, but what about the guy who uses NVDA, which is the open source Python screen reader that might deal with things a little bit differently, or who's using Orca on Linux, or who's using VoiceOver on an iPhone. And all of a sudden, all of these various, the, the matrix for that explodes exponentially. So it's a really, uh, 
inadvisable course of action to ever try to detect the user from a perspective of functional needs. What you'd like to do instead is say, am I following standards? Because if I do, then I know for a fact that the browser's job is to express this information correctly to the screen reader or to the screen enlargement software or to the on-screen keyboard, whatever they might be using as a form of assistive technology. One of those standards is called WCAG2, or WCAG2. Um, and it's the web, con uh, web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And uh, if you ever look at like the law or anything, when they say you know, a website needs to be accessible, that's actually what the regulations reference. And that's what a lot of folks in the world, like if anybody ever says this website is quote unquote accessible, what they're referencing from a standards point of view is WCAG2. And there's three levels there, by the way. There's A, AA, and AAA. Most folks try to aim for AA. It's a pretty good sweet spot in terms of compliance. And there are some checkers online that allow you to run a page through and get some feedback. They're not perfect. Accessibility testing, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you're looking at it, really requires user testing. You're not going to be able to automate it, unfortunately. I cannot give you a, a black box where you can throw code in and it says, this is, you know, ding, this is accessible. But it can at least point out some very clear, obvious mistakes. Um, Are if there any uh, user groups that you're aware of that you know, rattle the cage at things for things like that? There are folks, I mean, you know, there are folks like me and others who do it professionally. You know, we work with companies on a, like, you know, shameless plug. Uh, but also, there are. You know, it depends on what it is. If, if you're, like, are you at a museum, for example? Yeah. Okay, so, like, if you have blind patrons that come there regularly, you know, oftentimes, I mean, I'll do this for my local museum or for my local, you know, a business that I really want to support. I'll just give them a heads up. Hey, guys, you know, there's these seven accessibility bugs that are really bugging me on your website. Like, they're really preventing me from using your login system. Can you fix this? So, if you do some reach, some, some outreach, you will get some response. But at the end of the day, this is something, accessibility, much like security, you know, I mean, it's like saying, well, you know, are there hackers that will friendly, you know, just tell me that I've got security holes? Some, some are, yeah, they're out there. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> others might not want to, you know. So uh, you do a security audit. And, and similarly here with accessibility, you do an accessibility audit. And um, there are plenty of firms, not only mine, there's plenty of others uh, that, that do exactly that, that do accessibility audits for people. Or they just come in and work with your developers and say, hey guys, here are the basics, uh, here are some rules, here's some examples of some remediated stuff and this is how you should move forward. So um, there's also a toolbar for Firefox called the Wave toolbar, and that might be kind of helpful if you're just browsing around wondering about stuff. It'll give you a little bit of an accessibility report, and it'll even highlight some areas on your page that might be problematic. Um, so you had a quick question yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, go. With respect to browser detection, browser detection is you know, from web development templates, obviously, cat say these days. But isn't there room for accessibility and content negotiation? I mean, isn't that sort of what content negotiation is supposed to be for? So this is a topic that uh, chair of HTML5 accessibility stuff, me, a couple of others have really been going back and forth on on Twitter and some other, some other public forums. The, the, there was a, a survey done by WebAIM um, just a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks, months ago. Um, and uh, the results, w one of the questions they threw in at the end to users, this was, this was mainly taken by users of assistive technology on the web, okay? And when, so they asked them stuff like, what screen reader do you use, what operating system, what browser, all the standard stuff, right? At the end they asked, if the content um, creator, if the website that you're going to uh, could detect that you were running a screen reader, that you were running assistive technology, and would do things to help you, would you think that that is a good thing? Would you, would you, would you be okay with that, right? And they got a majority of people to say yes, which obviously, you know, if you look at that superficially, is, well, wow, I mean, users are okay with, ex you know, expressing this information, et cetera, et cetera. But again, it is an incredibly bad idea if you actually dig into it. First of all, the question wasn't written very well because it was basically only presenting the positive side and it wasn't counterbalanced and all the stats guys can go yell at them later. Um, but more importantly, what you're doing is you're taking the easy way out there, right? You're saying basically, I'm gonna have this hard-coded solution and it takes a lot of pressure off of folks like the Microsofts, the Mozilla's, the Googles of the world to actually implement accessibility correctly from a, from a content, just accessibility content guidelines point of view and also off of the assistive technologies to do their job correctly. 
And so that's fantastic for like the four big guys that will then go and implement that great side channel, wonderful like super accessibility highway. And then for everybody else who has to deal with regular interfaces, it will just continually uh, degrade until you've got nothing left. And so it's a really slippery slope. And uh, I would say a majority of us, as far as the like accessibility professionals go and folks who kind of live and breathe this stuff, I, I don't know anybody in that domain that's really kind of for it, uh, maybe one or two. Most are pretty much against it for a variety of reasons. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, not the way I wish to, but I understand your point. I mean, look, okay, so, so I'm a developer when I'm not wearing some of my other hats. I get it, all right? So if I have a Boolean that says if blind, I can do a lot of cool stuff. Oh, okay, <laughs> you make it. that's right, because vision is a, is a, is a continuum. Uh, but no, the thing is, okay, like the, the one geek joke, all right. But the thing is that it's just, it's just not a good idea. Just, just trust me on this, it's not, a, I mean, I'll be happy to talk to you about it over drinks, but I'm, yeah. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reasons you don't wanna do that. Uh, but it's interesting that you're asking that, and, and, um, and I'm sorry I didn't get your name, but you were, you were sort of li linking to that, the other gentleman was linking to that as well. This is a topic that's being discussed right now. It's, it's just generally a bad idea. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there, but feel free to, you know, we, we can follow up on that. Sec X. Um, so we've got this table. Oh, no, no, actually, before I go on, any other questions on this stuff? Anything at all? There you go. Yeah, that, that was just screen, uh, screensaver. Uh, any other questions on this stuff? Okay, so let's skip the, the table. Let's go to the end of the table. Table end. Okay. Blank. And let's, let's keep reading. Questions. Okay, questions. Blank. So we've got some questions. Table with six columns and three rows. All right, another table. Q1. Radio button not checked. A. Well, um, so I don't really know what the question is, but sure, whatever. Radio B. Radio button C. Radio button not checked. I don't know, D. Why, why not? Space. D. D. Radio B. Q2. Uh, okay, question two. Radio button A. Sure. Radio B. Radio C. Radio D. Radio button D. Q3. All right. Radio button not checked. Sure. Space, a radio A, radio B, radio C, radio D, radio B, table end. Okay, Blank. great. Table with six columns and four rows. Another table. Note, questions in red are optional. You jerk. Um, <laughs> so, that's awesome. A. Uh, great. Note, A, and then B, C, D. The letters of the alphabet e. in order. Blank. That's really cool. Question number one. And then, okay, hold on, this is promising. Blank, how would this table be altered if the figure was flipped so that Q was on right of the top of the circle? Like, what? Figure, yo. Um, the length of the right, iPod. Whatever. The altitude QR would change. I guess these are A, B, C, and D. They're not really labeled. The center O of the circle would move. The sign of the cosine would change. Yeah, whatever. Let's just go the with center C. The answer is always C. So let's just go all the way. The altitude the length. I would blank. Question blank. E, D, C, D, A. Note. Table with blank. Table and E. Radio but D. Radio C. Radio B. Radio A. Radio Q3 E. Radio D. Radio C. Radio B. Radio A. Radio Q2 E. Radio D. Radio but C. Radio space, C radio. Sweet. All right. Virtual. Now, let's go all the way back down. I'm not going to make you listen to that. C but to understand that particular user experience is to understand how I did calculus, calc 2, calc 3, chemistry, physics, English, every pretty much undergraduate class, all the homework assignments. So it doesn't matter if you can do the triple integrals in your head in one minute. It might take you 20 minutes to fill out a web page. So that's some of the real world examples of why accessibility matters. There's some very simple ways of fixing this. This is fixable with literally like a single digit number of characters of code, not even like lines of code. You just wrap these things in headers and you're done. And you don't use tables to lay this stuff out. It's, it's, it's really easy, I can show you on the next page. But that's the idea behind using proper markup because this is just horrendous and as a result, what you're doing is you're limiting the user by what they can or can't see, for example, in this particular case, not by what they know or what they can know. And, you know, this is more of an assessment uh, sort, of, sort of environment, but this is obviously very extrapolatable to things like documents, to things like an exhibit where a particular modality might be perfectly fine if you can see, and then you say, well, okay, we can make it accessible, let's just put some speech on it, but if you don't really think through that whole accessibility versus usability thing, this is sometimes the outcome that comes out of it. Does that make sense? Awesome. Uh, and then, again, uh, we don't know which one's red either, so we don't know which one's optional, right? And so that's the idea behind never use color as your sole way of conveying information. It's fine to use color. I think sometimes people go away with it and they're like, man, like color is horrible. Everything is black and white from now. It's like, that's not really the takeaway there. Um, so I mean, if you want to be minimalist, that's cool, but that's not the takeaway. The takeaway is you can use color. Um, be careful about things like colorblindness, you know, red, green, that sort of thing, red, blue. Uh, be careful about 
you know, uh, color contrast issues. So those WCAG guidelines we talked about a second ago, the WCAG uh, two guidelines, they have color contrast uh, right, right in there. So like 4.5 to 1, 7.5 to 1, the, the ratio between the foreground and the background. There are tools out there that will just render your page. They'll show you the color contrast for you. So you don't have to go doing the math yourself. It'll just do it for you. Um, and it'll just show you, hey, this needs to be darker. This needs to be lighter. Pick a different color scheme here. So that's some of the things that surround color. And if you're going to use color, feel free to use it, but also use something else. So for example, one of the things we'll see on the next page here is we'll put a red star, a red, red asterisk. So the, the screen reader will read that in addition to it being red. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. So let's go to the, okay, so actually before I do, I'm going to, I'm going to pause here. Any kind of general web questions? We've talked a little bit about a couple of things. Any other things before I kind of go to the better demo page? So any just general questions? Ah, so you want to convey information only to the screen reader, correct? Yes. Okay, so now that is a, kind of like the, the inverse of the question you were asking earlier. That, there's definitely ways of doing. Um, there's a couple of ways of doing it. So there's a CSS trick for doing it, which is that you can position the content uh, 999 pixels off to the left, negative left. Um, there are uh, a few other uh, approaches that involve basically CSS type things, you know, collapsing it down to zero height, that sort of stuff. But there are actually some semantic ways of doing that as well using ARIA. So I mentioned ARIA earlier, the accessible rich internet applications. Uh, that is part of HTML5. Actually, it's, a, it's an official standard as of like two weeks ago. It passed everything. So 1.0. Uh, this was a big deal for like a very small group of people, but it was a, a lot of people worked very hard on that standard. And that is an official spec now. Um, so and official spec meaning there's already a few Yes, there's already few implementations. It's passed all the W3C stuff. Like you can point to it and say 1.0 is right there. It's a real thing. It's no longer draft. None of that stuff. It's 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 a it's a real deal. Um, and uh, and you know 1.1 is already you know already being worked on and stuff and 2.0 and so on and so forth. Uh, but in Aria. There are things like roles. So you can assign roles to things. You can take a div, for example, that you want to act like a button, and you can say role equals button. Okay. Now, there's always, uh, you have to be very careful here. When you say role equals button, the screen reader will act, will, will tell the, the, the user that that is a button. It will not do the keyboard handling for you because it's not an actual button, okay? It's just being rolled as a button, okay? So when, when you say role equals button, you don't get magical enter handling and all that stuff. You gotta do that JavaScript yourself which is why the idea is if you want a button, use an actual button. Don't go off making a div, right? So yeah, so if you want an edit box, don't be like Google Docs and make a div that gets written to, all right? And you'd be amazed how inaccessible Google Docs is because it's completely unsemantic. It's just everything in there is a complete and utter hack, but it's, it, you know, it does work, <laughs> but, but yeah, you can feel free to quote me on that. <laughs> uh, Oh, that, 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 I, I, they, they know, we, we've had conversations. But um, no, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, this is, I mean, it's a public thing. You can look at the code. There's, 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 no, there's nothing hidden here, right? Like, it, it is a, a product that works, but from an accessibility point of view, there's a lot of absence of semantics, and the reason is that the underlying framework doesn't allow for that to be conveyed, unless if you rerolled that as basically edit fields, buttons, that sort of thing, as opposed to casting divs at runtime. So to answer your web question, there's a couple of ways to do accessibility specific information. Um, you'll see one other one on the next screen with a hidden link, uh, but those are the main ones between ARIA and then CSSing the information off screen. Great. Those are the, the main two. Land. Um, Land. Link graphic to demo slash. Uh, okay, Land. So Access. Better demo page. Shift tab. Toolbar home tab. The demo. Accessibility. Jaws. D. Escape. Access. Land. Right. Tab. 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 Link. For link. For link. For link. Tab. Activity. Tab. Question. Tab. Tab. Click for access. Land. For the better demo, click enter. Accessibility better test demo. Activity link. Accessibility better test same page link. Skip the main content. Okay, so we have accessibility a access app. New tab page. Skip the main content. Same page link. Okay, it says same page link. Skip the main content. So this is called a skip link or a skip the content link. The idea here is that um, this is a link that does not take you somewhere else. That's why it's called the same page link. Jaws let you know. The screen reader lets you know. Hey, this is going to take you somewhere else on this page if you click it. 
Um, and what happens when you do click it, when you do activate it, is it takes you to wherever the link points to. In this particular case, uh, a skip to main content link, the kind of the, the idiom here, the, the best practice is to jump to the beginning of the content of the page. So over the navigation, over the header and stuff like that, directly to the beginning of the content. Um, I'm not gonna hit it because I want you to see some other stuff that's, that's after it, but that's basically how that, that, how that works. Um, some folks say with the advent of HTML5, with things like the main section and you know, navigation, basically semantic markup for, for those of you who, who deal with that, uh, that this might not be needed as much, but it really is useful to, again, not just somebody who's blind who wants to skip all that navigation stuff, but also, for example, maybe somebody who's a switch user. So uh, do you guys know who Stephen Hawking is, for example? All right, so he's a switch user, right? So he's got a jaw muscle that's probably like the most atrophied jaw muscle on the planet Earth, and he, by actuating, eh, eh, can make a, can, can send a binary signal to a cursor that moves on the screen, right? And the cursor moves on the screen, it's scanned, and then as he actuates his jaw, a uh, little, you know, little sensor uh, basically says, okay, click, right? And so that's how he can do keyboard entry and everything like that, which is just, you know, I mean, incredibly frustrating, one would imagine, but, you know, he writes entire, entire books that way and actually scientific papers that way and navigates a computer interface that way. So somebody like Hawking, for example, if he comes across something like this and wants to scroll down the page, it would be very simple for him to land on a skip to main content link. Sometimes these are hidden, sometimes these aren't, sometimes they're made focusable once you tab to it so such that when that cursor automatically gets to it, sorry about that blink. Um, and. Uh, you know, then uh, he, could, he could just hit it and he wouldn't have to wait for the scanning cursor to go all the way down. So it's not just useful for somebody who's blind, there's a lot of other populations that can benefit from something like a skip to main content link. Also on mobile, again, it, it can be helpful as well. Does that, does that make sense? All right. Navigation region. Okay, so then we heard navigation region. This is again HTML5, it's letting you know this region, this, this series of stuff over here, this is navigation stuff. Uh, so it's just semantic markup, okay? It's letting you know what this stuff is. Again, it's fantastic for search engine optimization. It's also great for accessibility. Heading level two navigation. I've got a hidden heading here that says navigation. This is a little bit of backwards, graceful degradation, if you will. The idea being if you're not using a modern web browser that knows about things like a navigation region, there's also a heading here, and we'll go over headings in a second, but um, uh, there's a heading here that lets you jump to the navigation region of the page. Uh, when I do say headings, so who here in the context of the web is familiar with, with headings? So basically like the H tag. Okay, so, what's that? Yeah, so, so what does it do? Okay. So, you're never allowed to say that again. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> that is exactly what most people think it does. It makes things big. It turns out what makes things big is things like emphasis or you know strong or CSS. What header does is it does have the consequence of making things big, but that is not what it is for. What it's for is to lay things out. So you've seen a, um, an outline for like a paper or a, for a book, right? You got the title, you got the chapters, let's say. Maybe under chapter two, you've got chap subchapter 2.1, that sort of thing. That's what headings are. Right? Level one heading is the title. Level two are all the chapters are at that level of heading. The level three headings are like 1.1. The level four headings are 1.1.3, that sort of thing. Okay, that's what headings are for. So they're structural markup. So they're incredibly important in that role because what they allow you to do, if you use them correctly, is not make things big, but to allow the user to jump around the page by them. Uh, so for example, Navigation heading level two, accessibility demo heading level one. Why is this course important? Let us look questions heading level, question number one, question number two, head star question number three, heading level four. You can navigate quickly between those, right? Just with a hit of a button. Question, qu questions heading level, why is this course important? I can navigate, I can jump around all of the page by just logically marking certain things as headings, I'm able to do that, right? And so just with that uh, little bit of code, literally H2 slash H2, that's all it is, I was able to really facilitate uh, non-linear navigation on this page, not forcing the user to go up and down arrow all the time. Does that, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. But I just want to thank a mention of the publisher here that needed to add that explanation to users on the web website so that when the discussion was happening on the blog, they could see it and understand what they're saying. Yeah. Well, that's what I was saying. Yeah. 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 Definitely, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely feel free to do so. Also, things like the, the wave toolbar will tell you about um, 
uh, out of order heading usage and, and, and things like that. It won't tell you about bolded text that should have been a heading because that's a little bit more advanced, but um, at least it will tell you about incorrect use of headings sometimes. Uh, Wikipedia, by the way, is a fantastic example of this done correctly. So, you know, you go to biology and it's got like the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, those are all level two headings you can drill down. So I can just fly across Wikipedia. And it's, it's simple stuff like just using headings and, and just me uh, being able to hit the H key on my keyboard and just navigate between them. It's that simple. Okay, let's jump to the navigation section, which I'm able to do because of the heading. Navigation heading level two. And? Navigation region. Heading list, link graphic list of 11 items. List of 11 items. Okay, so it let me know, hey, there's 11 things coming up. There's a list, um, and uh, that means that I can jump the whole thing if I want to because it's all grouped. Uh, let's go through the list. What's the first thing in the list? Link graphic NC State logo. Okay, so it's a logo. It's a, it's a link. It's a graphic, and it said NC State logo. So this is as simple as this is called alt text. If, if, if you've heard of alternative text or alt text on an image, it's a way of describing the image. It, this is the text that shows up if the image can't be rendered, or it's the image text that gets read if you're using a screen reader. Okay, so that's all it is. It's just a label for the image. Now you might be tempted to say, okay, well that's kind of awesome. I'm going to go label all of my images, which you really should be saying, except with one little caveat. You know, it turns out that things like, you know, the, the, the sun is shining on a plant as like a yellow glow surrounds the logo is probably not what I want to hear. That's very cool, and maybe on a more artistic website, probably appropriate, um, at least in some form, maybe as a long description or as a caption. But the thing is, it's not informationally relevant or, or, or actionably relevant at, at the time. What I really wanted to know out of this was NC State logo. Like I immediately got a lot of things out of that. that. I know what entity it is. I know that it's a logo, most likely because it's a link. If I hit enter on that, I'm gonna go to their homepage. There's a lot of information conveyed there by just NC State logo, as opposed to describing that logo. So again, that whole thing versus you know gray versus unavailable, you wanna keep that in mind when coming up with language for description of images. Um, the other thing is sometimes images are used, although, you know, again, hopefully this is becoming less and less on the web, for layout purposes. And you don't want to go putting um, alt text on those. And the reason you don't want to do that is because then it will read it. So for example, one popular uh, construct, uh, one, one very evil, evil construct, was a one by one pixel GIF, uh, if anybody remembers uh, that being used on the web. So this was a very cheap way of doing pixel perfect layouts, people would put in an image on the website that was only one pixel wide. And then they would put a alt tag on it. So they put an alt text on it, like spacer. So you would hear things like account balance, spacer, 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 spacer. And like, it's just like, you just kill me now. All right, and it's, it's horrible. And there's no way to skip it, right? I mean, I can skip graphics, I can, it's really, really bad. If they don't put alt text on it, it's even worse. 1x1.gif, 1x1.gif, 1x1.gif. So, you know, so the, the way you deal with that is you, you do put alt text on it, but you make the alt text empty. You make it quote, quote, just the empty string, empty, quote, quote. And when you do that, what happens is it'll say nothing. It'll just skip that thing. So that's the one kind of, you know, trick, if you will, uh, that you sort of need to explicitly be aware of, which is that if you've got some purely eye candy kind of stuff, uh, the way you can hide that away is by putting alt equals quote, quote. Does that make sense? So alt equals quote, quote is a default, it's in the best usage, don't quote me on this, usage guidelines uh, doc. So in WCAG, you've got several things. You've got the spec itself, but what's awesome about that is you've also got some pretty awesome um, like best, best practices documents, some uh, actual implementation guides, some uh, 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 examples of uh, implementation. So uh, that is definitely covered uh, in, that, in, 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 in those things. Um, and so I can point you to some research on that. On my personal web page. Control T, edit H. Okay, so a couple Alt of things. Alt D, double C, A, G, enter. Here's WCAG. List. Web content, web content. Right there. Web content access. It'll come back. Here. Web so here's WCAG right there. So that's the web content accessibility guidelines, okay? And there's a lot of links off of this to, to some, some, some things. But then if you want Alt to find a lot of these things, sdenter.cinebarum.com. Cinebarum.com. Cinebarum. And if you go to Bat virtual, enter. Bullet link resources, enter. New tab page. Resources visited. 
I've got Bad map recent from my temp policies and regular weapon document accessibility. I've got to update some of these, but top weapon document accessibility. Head document accessibility. Land head list of 29 items. I've got about like 29 links there. You know, these are somewhat helpful. Things like on headings, things on color contrast stuff, the link to ARIA, link to WCAG, that sort of stuff. So if you ever have trouble finding it, Google or this can definitely get you there. And obviously, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll hook you up. Accessibility better test demo. List of link graphic and C state logo. Okay, so we got the graphic. We got this link. Uh, we covered any other questions on kind of description of graphics or, or or anything like that. Okay. Link syllabus. So syllabus. Link notes. Link assignment so one. Vertical bars because it's on a list we can actually navigate it. Link assignment. Link assignment. Can even go backwards. Link assignment three. Link assignment two. Link assignment one. We can skip the whole thing. List end. List end. We're at the bottom of the list just with one keystroke. So because it's grouped, it just lets me do that. And if I hit up arrow. Link bad demo page. I have a link right there to the bad demo page, right? And it says link bad demo page. There's no more click here. Okay. List end. Navigate main re navigation region end. The navigation region ended. So this is the end of the navigation related stuff. That's again semantic markup. For the HTML folks in the room, it's just nav slash nav. Main region. Okay. Main region. So this is the main region of the page, which is fantastic because there's actually a hard coded keystroke that I can hit that will always jump me to the main region. So if, for example, a very large news website does things correctly and makes like the, the you know, the, the main region is the main content or a portal always puts the main region uh, on their page, I can always just skip all of the surrounding stuff, not only the navigation, but maybe the search, maybe the other things at the top and quickly jump to the main portion of the page just by hitting one key. So this is the advantages of semantic markup. Heading level one accessibility. Demo. Okay, so we got an accessibility demo, Land. which is a level one heading because it's the title of the page. This is a demonstration of a web page using CSS. Okay. We're talking about tri talking about trigonometry heading level three. Why is this course important? Let us look at the history of trig trigonometric tables were created over 2,000 years ago for computations in astronomy. The stars were thought to be fixed on the page. And so on and so forth. Right, and it reads it correctly, and there's no there's no uh, uh, downside there because that wasn't laid out using a using a table. It was laid out using CSS. Only the planet, the kind of. I'm gonna just skip my paragraph here. Spherical trigger, nonetheless. Sphere, no, graphic circle, nonetheless. Graphic circle. Okay, now land. we get to this graphic. So what do we, what do we have for an alt tag for this guy? Graphic circle with a perpendicular triangle showing the sine and cosine of the right angle. Definition of trigonometric functions. Draw unit. Okay, so we've got that graphic. I'm gonna read that one more time. Graphic circle with a perpendicular triangle showing the sine and cosine of the right angle. So that's helpful. It's a it's an alt text. It told me some stuff, but there was a lot more information to convey here if I'm supposed to answer this question correctly. So as a result, just using like the figure caption construct from HTML5, Defini we have oh. this as a caption. So let's read that. Definition of trigonometric functions. Draw unit circle with center O. Let a central angle with initial side OP and terminal side OQ contain X radians. That is the arc PQ at length X. Drop a perpendicular from Q to OP meeting it at R. Then OR equals cosine of X and RQ equals sine of X. If those directed line segments are upper to the right, the lengths are positive. If they are down or to the left, the lengths are negative. Sum cosine. Okay. So that's, that's how you know, it just conveyed a lot more information. Using that information, one is uh, able to answer the, the questions that are, that are coming up. So does that make sense? There was a short description, which was the alt text on the graphic, and then there was the longer description. In this particular case, it was needed, and so as a result, it was the, it was the caption. All right. And by the way, that can benefit other people as well, not just somebody who's blind. Which is Land. pretty important. Summary values showing trick functions this at different has a summary line set. And so the summary is this. Summary values showing trick functions at different values of X. Okay. So it just lets you know kind of what's coming up, which is pretty important. Land table with seven columns and six rows. Okay, same table as before, seven columns and six rows. X. Sine of X. Cosine of X. But now it's reading it correctly. Tangent of X. Cotangent of X. Secant of X. Cop zero. One. Row two. Okay. Not only is it Out reading it correctly, but it can do stuff like Not in the table. Sorry. Uh, Table sine zero zero cosine of x one column three. So it says cosine of x one. If I wanted to know which one, I could just hit down arrow and up arrow. Two zero one row. Two. See, it says zero one. So if I ever change rows, it reads the column. If I ever change or if I ever change my position in the column, it reads the row. If I ever change my position in the row, it reads the column. So if I go to the right, it will read me the column. Tangent of x cotangent of x tan cosine of x. If I ever go up and down, it'll read me the values on the left. Two slash three square root of three slash three slash four square root of two slash two row five slash six one slash two row five. You see. And so, as a result, just because those things are labeled correctly, it knows to read them because it because the screen reader knows to always read the label if one exists uh, based on those movement patterns. That was encoded in by the web developer. All the web developer had to do was mark up the table correctly. So, does that make sense? Okay. 
Uh, and then there's other things like cosine tangent, cotangent of x, negative square root, secant of x, minus 2, 2, 1, bottom of column, flat 3, slash 2, slash 0, 1, secant of x, cosine 0, 2, slash 3, slash 5, slash 2, under bottom of column, 5, slash 2, undefined, rows it. And it says undefined. It doesn't say blank, which is what it said before, uh, what it would have said before on the previous table um, when it wasn't labeled correctly. It just says something sensible like undefined. Table end. Um, if you're interested in how that's done, by the way, the way I did that was using the abbreviation tag for those of you who, who are interested in such things. Uh, and I just set the abbreviation to be the, the like COS and uh, the actual expansion to be cosine. And that's also helpful also when you're doing stuff like this, if you ever have a facility to do this like in a content management system, it's really helpful for things like English as a second language uh, uh, visitors, for example, where you m have a situation in which you might uh, display bilingual information or you might be have some complicated information like an acronym or a technical term that you want to expand with a tooltip or when they run their finger or mouse over it, you can put that stuff in the abbreviation and then uh, it'll expand for them. Land, table. So there's a lot of ways of, of using that for for doing good things. Blank. Heading level three questions. Okay, so heading level three, questions, and then what do we have? Note, questions denoted with a red star are optional. Okay, so they're still red, but now they have a red star. That makes a lot more sense. I can detect that. Blank. Heading level four, question number one. Okay, so what about the other level four headings? Question number two, heading level four. And the other one? Star question number three, heading level four. And it said star, so I immediately know that one's optional. Let's go up and answer question two. All we have to do is just go up one. Question number two, heading level four. And we can just jump to it. Blank. And the table the sign never has a negative sign. Why not? And then we can go through the answers. A, because sine of x is always e. B, because cos of c. But D, because the headers of the table should space. D, because the headers of the table should be in alphabetical. Right there, right? So nonsensical answer, of course. But, um, and that's, it's just very simple to do. We can go to the next question. Root E, none of the above. Radio button star question number three, heading level four. And quickly just navigate it that way. And again, all we did was we just added some headers. We didn't use tables to lay these things out. Some very basic forms accessibility. If you're interested in that, I'll be happy to talk about it. But just by very simple markup, very simple addition of code, we were able to make all of that happen. So that's that's sort of a, the difference between you know, good and bad. So let me let me pause there, and then of course there's a just to be comprehensive. Submit button. There's a submit button. Reset button. And a reset button at the bottom of the form. Uh, so let me pause there for a second and see if there's any questions on uh, any other questions on like web accessibility or anything we've we've seen here. Anything at all? Okay. So uh, let. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> awesome. Look forward to it. Um, uh, let me <clears throat> let me switch gears again here. So do this. Okay. There's that. Any other things you wanted to see with the screen reader before I go back to me listening to him alone? Any other questions on that? That would be amazing. All right. There. Yes. Oh, okay, well, it is, it's 2.55, and the thing is, uh, I'm about to switch gears, so I've got like one, two more slides on web accessibility. Do you want me to then break it there so we can do coffee, tea, and then come back? Up to you guys. I'm perfectly fine with that. All right, so let me uh, switch back over here. Oh, and forgive me for one second, but this has to get faster. In case you were wondering, just for interest, um, uh, the rate I listen to it about is about, um, uh, I think when I clocked it last, around 900 to 950 words a minute. So that's pretty, pretty fun. Um, we did once get me using some, some other algorithms and a very expensive pair of speakers uh, up to about uh, 14, 1500 words a minute, which was fun because the first chapter of Huckleberry Finn was 28 seconds. <laughs> So that was what you do when you're bored, I guess. Uh, so, all right, so just a comical note. So, uh, can you see that? No. no? That's never good in computing. How about now, no? Hold on, let me refresh it. Okay, three, two, one. How about now? Okay, hold on, there's, how about now? Anything? Okay, I'm not totally out of ideas, but um, 
All right. It is? Yeah. Hold on. Cool. Okay. Now let me. Good deal. That'll blink for a second and it'll hopefully come back. There we go. Okay. So you, do you see it? There we go. Okay. So, um, so sensibility can be fun. This is just an example of a shirt. I made a buddy of mine, Billy Gregory. <laughs> So I did actually design that, so if it looks horrible, there you go. Um, it is a universally designed shirt. The shirt is in Braille as well. Uh, and he's got his little funny tagline that he puts the bill in accessibility, because that's his name. Um, and also the back of the shirt can be seen here. And um, just from an HTML joke point of view, we have beard slash beard on the back. And again, that's also in Braille as well. So that was my excuse to get random people to feel him up at a conference we were at. <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll leave it on this, the ice free interaction stuff, if we want to break for uh, tea or whatnot, and then uh, uh, come on back. There we go. All right, so um, a couple of things. Uh, ice free interaction. So I, I like to use ice free, um, you know, basically this is sort of the idea of not just making it about being blind. Um, if you think about it, I mean, so who in here drives, for example? You know, a car. Okay. <laughs> like, because that would, that's the like, most interesting audience I've ever had. Um, okay. um, Nancy really didn't tell me everyone's blind in the room, and I'm really wasting my time. Um, so uh, when you're driving, what you should not be doing is looking at your phone. So you're, you're functionally blind in that particular case. And so using words like eyes free, using the idea of, of, of eyes free interfaces, it doesn't just relate to, um, it doesn't just relate to, to, to like somebody who can't see. It relates to a lot of other situations in which you might not be able to see something. Um, so that's, if you see me use that term, that's why I use it. Um, so you, you, you heard a traditional audio interface. Right? It was very linear. It was a screen reader. Yes, things like headings and semantic markup allow you to jump around. That's awesome. Uh, but for the most part, it was, it was linear. You know, top down, left to right. Uh, that's sort of the way it goes. It's keyboard-based access. Um, so not that 2D stuff that you can get uh, in the visual domain. You can't just skim. You can't just jump somewhere uh, because your eye gets attracted to it. So that's just something to keep in mind. And we'll talk about how that's different in the, in the, in the touch world. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, <clears throat> there are things like shortcuts. We talked about that, like you know, cut, control X, undo, control Z, those kinds of things. Those do make it a little bit less linear, but still, it, it's a pretty linear um, thing. We talked about semantic markup, so this idea that the more you tell the computer, the more you enrich your content with what the content is about, the more you describe that content electronically, digitally, with metadata, um, the, the better it is. Not only the better it is for folks using assistive technology, not only the better it is for uh, other folks who might want to consume the content uh, programmatically, but you know, search engine optimization, it's better for security. There's all of these advantages that come up the more metadata and the more description you put into your content. So does kind of those broad overviews, I mean, we just experienced a lot of them. Does that all make um, a decent amount of sense? Any questions on that? All right. So desktop interaction, we saw how that worked. Uh, basically, the one takeaway is that there's a bit of a disconnect between the eyes free interface, right, the screen reader interface, and the visual representation, right? So you can't just say, oh, Cena, it's the button on the right. That's not really meaningful. Maybe I have to tab to it. Maybe I have to say, okay, well, is it after login or is it before help? Is it after the questions area or the questions heading? So even if it's accessible, even if it's marked up well and it's an interface that I can use easily, it's still not the, the that, that, that disconnect exists between basically, uh, let's say, a sighted uh, a colleague and a, and a, a not cited colleague uh, collaborating on, on something. And that's a very big deal in the desktop space, uh, in the traditional computing space. It makes collaboration more difficult. It makes things like learning somewhat uninclusive, right? So you've got like a, a fifth grader. She is really interested in something. She's using a computer in a very different way because maybe she's blind and using a piece of assistive technology. She's not using it the same way as her friends are. So there's a lot of inclusion issues and social issues that come up as a result of this difference. Um, Spatial information is hard to convey as a result, right? So things like graphics, you can 
describe them, or maybe the things like the layout of an application, such as the toolbar being on top, you can sort of describe that stuff. But again, the positioning doesn't really matter in a, in a, in a traditional interface. However, then we get to mobile. So in mobile, it's a little bit different. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave those slides up, but let me, um, so who in here is familiar with the iPhone? Yeah. All right, good, that was just the are you awake question. So, <laughs> all right, so here, here's an iPhone. I'm gonna show you how I use this. So I realize I'm not projecting this and I apologize, but however, what I can do is I can at least get the audio into the room. So that we can do. Here we go. So this will be somewhat non-visual, but all right. Three twenty-nine. Cool. And screen curtain on. Wednesday, April second. Screen curtain off. Okay. Now again. Get test my room. The whole speed. Double tap to open. So test slide. Slow her down. Let carry words. Handwriting. Speech rate. Volume. Speech rate. One nine eight eight. Fifty-five percent. Fifty percent. Better. Okay, so anywhere I touch on this, so, so if you were to use this device, anywhere you would touch, that is what would happen, right? You touch Shazam, it opens Shazam. You touch YouTube, it opens YouTube, right? Very, like what you see is what you can get, a concept we're all pretty familiar with. That doesn't make a lot of sense if I'm using this device because I don't know what I'm touching. And so because I don't know what I'm touching, we need to decouple or separate the act of selection and activation, right? So for example- Stitcher, source, passbook, fill it, Shazam. Starbucks, white room, FaceTime, photos. Right, so what Double. happens is it first reads what's under my finger, gives me a little click, I'll talk about the sound in a second, and tells me what's under my finger. It gives me a little bit of help text as well. Photos. Double tap to open. Right, I didn't do anything for about a half a second. It said double tap to open, and that was actually very important. It said double tap to open. Anywhere I double tap on the screen, it has state. It knows what I touched last. It'll open that thing, okay? I can also, instead of just touching on Track the screen. Social FaceTime. I can swipe. So Double tap to open. Shift tab. Right room. This has so news. You fill it. One new app. This right room. Fake. Phone. Game. Test. Hate. News. Page. Phone. Page one of nine. Adjustable. Swipe up or down with one finger to adjust the value. Right. So. Page three of nine. Page four of nine. Page five of nine. I have a lot of apps, by the way. Um, so. Radio jab. OLV. Podcasts. Amazon. Okay. So stuff like that, right? I have multi-finger gestures that I can do. Page four of nine. Page three of nine. So page that's two important of because it's a global level of access. I didn't have to go all the way down to that page control. Settings. Bottom, okay. What I, I could have done instead is the three finger swipes and I'm immediately there. Page one of nine. Okay. Page I can stop her from talking. I can Stitcher. Have her Stitcher. Read Eight new items. So Shazam. Okay. No one new item. Fill okay. it. One new item. Pause her. And then I can resume her. Sixteen apps. Two hundred twenty six new items. So new stand. One new Hush. Um, then the other things that you can do are, um, I actually have some input modalities that you might not have access to. So for example, one of the interesting things that they added in iOS 7, they're probably just betaing this before they release it for everybody is. Handwriting, Handwriting. lowercase. So I can actually draw on my screen, so. S, 31 apps, Safari, C, five apps, scan. And those are all the SC applications. Scan my, scan snap, scan a pro, screen. There you go, right? And I can backspace one with a two finger left. S. 31 apps. These are all the S apps. One more left. 246 apps. Okay, right? So that's what, you know, so it's basically a really quick way of indexing into a lot of information. And all I did was I wrote on the screen just using handwriting recognition, uh, which I thought was a pretty novel interface. So I like to show that one off usually. The other advantage to something like this is, remember we were talking about that whole lack of collaboration before, but now it's not. If you tell me go to the upper right hand corner, I can do that. R. Eight apps. Oh, sorry, L. Speech rate. There we go. Stitcher. So eight new item. App store. Right? There's Double tap to right open. Corner. I can touch the top where you would see the signal strength indicator. Orientation 333 PM. Network connection. LTE. AT&T network. Minus 84 signal strength. That's St just because I have a hack that tells me the DBM, but don't worry about that. Um, you you would have you, you would have heard five bars. Um, and, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and so. AT minus 84 signal strength. Four of five. Eight. Four of five bars. There signal there. strength. Yeah. Status bar item. So, Minus 84. Switch that back. So, uh, and you saw I double tapped anywhere on the screen. I didn't have to go find that thing and double tap. So it's very aware of a sensible way of doing this. The one last thing I'll show you on this is that there are invisible menus. So I can turn a rotor on the screen. Headings, sounds, language, Twitterific, notif Twitterific, mentioned by at antenna underscore lab. RT at art blind site as free interface does not necessarily mean for people who are blind. There, I just want Finance to. Finance folder. That was just a tweet that came in, but I decided to let it read. But, uh, <laughs> 
That's okay. Uh, and so, you know, you can, you can basically, you know, change uh, words, you know, characters, that, and you can change an invisible rotor. What that does is it remaps what my flick up and flick downs do. So on a web page, if I quickly remember I was navigating by heading on my keyboard by hitting H, what I would do on like Wikipedia on my phone is go to the rotor, go to headings, and then up and down navigates by heading. I want to navigate by form field, like on a login form. I quickly turn the rotor to form field, again, up and down maps to form field. So there's this quick way of, of providing eyes-free access to a touch screen, okay? This is often referred to as an access overlay because it's this invisible overlay that reads you the screen, right? The one last trick I'll show you is I get way better battery life than all of you because screen curtain on. I don't have to have screen on. And so, so you start well, I page, three, page four of not. All right, so there's that. So that is how a, um, that is how an eyes-free way, that's, that's an eyes-free approach for, for using um, basically something like an iPhone, right? And um, it's, it's often called an access overlay and basically it just allows you to decouple that access selection and, and navigation. Now, I'm gonna turn her speech off so that she doesn't make sounds and interrupt. All right, and then let's go back, let's go back to this. Any, any questions on that and like how that works or, or, or what that was about? Okay. That was pretty self-explanatory. All right, so that's how somebody who's blind can use a touch screen, right? And we'll get a little bit into some of the misconceptions around that in a bit. Um, a yeah, go for it. So an ATM with a headphone drive, I mean, that's gonna be more button actuated, right? As opposed to, to touch. So I guess I've seen some touch screens. Have I used any of the touch ATMs? Ah, uh, I've used some prototypes. Um, not exact, so, so don't quote me on this, but I believe the touch, the accessibility approach for the touch screen version of the ATMs mimics what they did for voting machines, which is they didn't make the touch screen accessible, they just made the four corners of the screen accessible, such that they're all buttons, and then they basically tell you, like hit the top left hand corner for back, or hit the top right hand corner for, for option two or whatever, and then they basically map a menu system on top of that. I could be wrong about that, if they've got a fully accessible touch screen ATM, but I haven't encountered one and I, uh, I don't know. Okay, so, so touch screens in museum galleries depends on what they're running. So it, this is an area where, depending on like, for example, which client I'm working with, uh, they're either rolling their own in that they're taking the concepts from Apple, for example, accessibility guidelines, the access overlay stuff, and they're actually implementing that stuff, or uh, they are able to take advantage of the fact that voiceover exists on something like iOS or voiceover exists on something like uh, the Mac, and so therefore they use standard controls and then map touch to it. But the thing is, if you wanted to do what you just saw there, you would have to implement some of that, knowing what you are able to know about you know, what, how the iPhone works, you'd have to implement some of that in the exhibit or in that specific thing, because you know, something like you know, whatever interface, whatever toolkit, whatever platform you're using is not gonna give you that for free. That access overlay doesn't come for free. It's just an approach that Apple chose to go with. It's a particularly good one from you know, being familiar with the literature, but that's, you know, that's what, uh, that, that, that's, how they, that's how they did it. That's a custom thing. Um, but it is the best practice for how to make a touch screen accessible. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So access overlay, basically, just if you ever come across this term, is essentially the theoretical name for this, and it's, it's the idea of what we just saw. You can explore, you have gestures. If I want to, for example, if you were to double tap on something, you can do that on an iPhone. If you want to double tap on something, I would triple tap, right? Because there's that extra thing, right? Whenever I tap once, it reads things. So for me, it's just plus one. But that's the only change needed, and all of a sudden, somebody can just come and touch something on my screen, and it makes sense. All right, they can go over here and I say, oh, okay, over there. I know exactly what it is, it reads it, and I can even follow their finger to know where it is positionally for next time. So that's the really big key advantage to, um, to touch-based accessibility. All right, so we, we sort of did that. Okay, so uh, my major idea here is that, you know, again, just hammering home this idea that selection is very different for a nice free user versus uh, a sighted user and that you really need to think about that if you're ever designing a touchscreen interface. These are some of the ways that you can easily make it accessible, but that's the, the key takeaway is that this act of navigation and selection is it's decoupled for, you know, for, for a nice free user. 
Um, just the kind of thoughts on multimodal in general as we wrap this particular section up. So the idea being that the more modalities you have of accessing something, touch, speech, you know, you, this also can output to a Bluetooth Braille display, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the, the better off you are. The more modalities you can offer the user to both give you input and also to get output from your system, uh, the, the truly richer sort of environment you can present to them. But also kind of for free, you can accommodate or adapt certain sensory limitations on their part. So that's the big thing for, for multimodal. Uh, the other thing is that if you look at the literature, one of the nice advantages of multimodal interfaces is that uh, their, they don't, uh, their error regions don't line up. So what that means is the places where computers get speech wrong are not the same places where computers get, vo uh, where they get screen touch stuff wrong. And the places where they get touch wrong are not the same places where they get speech wrong. So if you combine these two things, it's actually greater than the sum of the parts because their error regions don't overlap. And so as a result, they can accommodate each other. And so, you know, if you have the user say, put this there, and it understood like, you know, put this her, it still can understand because the touch event would get understood very clearly. So it's a nice trick just from a development point of view or if you're ever thinking about interfaces to always have multiple modalities because you can really accommodate a lot more error by just adding in another way of having the user express things. Does that, does that make sense? That makes a little bit less sense. I'm hearing a lot less yes. Okay. Okay, so the idea is, let's say you had a purely voice-based interface, okay? All you could do is you could talk to it and it could talk to you, okay? And you wanted to tell it stuff like send an email to blah, 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 or, or let's say you wanted to do graphic stuff like, uh, you know, take this triangle and move it over there, you know, that sort of stuff. If you only had voice, if it messed up, if the computer misheard you, or if it didn't, you know, understand you correctly, then it's a, there's a very high chance that it's gonna make a mistake. Do you, do you agree with that? It's, okay, so here's the thing though. If you combine that with a touch screen, okay, and you're touching that triangle as you're talking about it, even if the computer totally misheard you about talking about a triangle, it can make up for it with the fact that it knew you were touching that thing on the screen, which is the triangle. So the areas in which the computer might make mistakes in one modality, like speech or audio, is not the same areas that it makes mistake in other modalities, like touch or like keyboard. So when you combine these two systems together or add yet a third system on top of that, like eye tracking or whatever, the more you can gather input from the environment, the more accurate your interface can actually be as a result because the error regions are in different places. Does that, does that make a little bit more sense? Yeah. All right. So, uh, we'll go back here. Mm -hmm. And sorry, this is having a sync issue. Let me just do this. You're gonna see a flash. We're gonna see another flash, because that's how we roll. Okay, you got it up? Okay. All right, so this is the idea of how can you view accessibility. Sort of switching gears here a little bit, but my basic idea here is that you could either you know, be like, this is a total burden, I have to do it for legal reasons, and da 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 and, or you can see some really cool potentials here, and it doesn't only help, like, you know, your disabled users or patrons or whatnot, it really helps everybody. So pretty, pretty standard, simple argument, but something I tend to be very passionate about, make lemons, lemonade, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's the basic idea there. Um, okay, it's the one legal slide, so just so I can say that I told you. So the idea here is, you know, it's the right thing to do, but it's also the law. Um, and there's a lot of other international things going on. There's the UN Convention of Civil Rights for Persons with Disabilities. There's ADA, there's 508. There's all of these things. Uh, Europe has their own regulations as well that make this not only a good idea, but a smart idea from a compliance point of view. Um, I would like to point out that, in my experience, museums are the good guys. It's usually a bunch of really cool people, uh, really excited about what they're doing, really passionate about whatever it is that they're passionate about. And so when you let them know that you know, there's this other audience that isn't able to appreciate this particular thing, um, it's a really cool environment in which to make that, make that happen. So I like to approach accessibility from that angle as opposed to the legal angle, but that's just, just putting that out there. Any questions on that before I, I suppose, before I, before I, go for it. Well, first of all, when you say new laws well, that regulate. Those new regulations. Right, so, so, so 508 got refreshed. Yeah. Um, but 
it's DOJ has in me to, okay, I, I'm, I'm not even cute enough to play a lawyer on TV. So, you know, full disclosure on, um, don't, don't take your legal advice from me. Um, all right, but um, DOJ has made very strong uh, indications, as strong as, you know, DOJ indications tend to be, that they're going to start viewing the websites of public entities as public places, similar to, for example, the lobby of a supermarket or something like that. As a result, making it subject to ADA, as a result, making it subject to 508, as a result, therefore, having it be compliant with WCAG, WCAG, which we just talked about, because that's what the regulations actually use when they say accessible. So that's the chain of logic there. Now, obviously, things like universities have already always been under that umbrella because they get federal funds, and so the public, you know, there's Title III and Title II, all this, all this boring stuff, right? So the thing is, though, when you're saying, you know, websites in general, that gets a little bit more murky. So, for example, does Netflix have to make their website accessible, right? Should they? The answer is obviously very much yes. Do they have to legally is still an, an unknown, that, that precedent has not been set yet. And probably won't be for a while because it's going to require a lot of you know a lot of things. What I will say is that for the most part, every case that has been brought up has been won by the plaintiff. So the Target case, and there have been several others. So I will put that caveat out there that if you really want to play that game, you will most likely lose. If not legally, then at least in public opinion and a lot of other reasons. So it's generally a bad idea to ignore it for that you know for that reason. Now let's go to your more specific question about apps. So apps are you know, no different than websites in, in some way in that they are simply a digital uh, instantiation of a representation or a manifestation of, a, of, of, of an entity's, you know, persona to you, right? Like their, their interaction with you. So like a bank app allows you to do certain things with the bank. And so if it's not accessible, you could very much easily claim that you're not able to do things accessibly with the bank because you have a disability and that would be very, that would be very bad if that's their only course of letting you do those things, like transfer money or check a balance account or something like that, an account balance. So I would say that uh, if DOJ kind of continues the way they, they, they've been, apps are gonna be subject to that sort of thing, but apps are already subject to all of the things that websites and uh, even public places are when it comes to, again, the institution, the, if it's a school, if it's a university, if it's a public place, then it's already subject to that sort of stuff. So, but that's my completely uneducated legal answer so I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to lead you wrong. But if you do have very specific questions on that, uh, I know some awesome legal scholars in this space, and I can be happy to ask them for you, or connect you directly to them. Uh, any other questions on that stuff? All right. So this is an interesting thing. I don't know if you guys uh, saw this. Um, uh, Tim Cook, who's the current CEO of Apple, uh, was at a board meeting. And um, this conservative group out of New York was giving him a little bit of a hard time. Um, excuse me, and I said board meeting, it was a stockholders meeting. And they were giving him a hard time because Apple uh, has green data centers, and right? So, and the, so the stockholders were, the, the conservative group that this was representing, this series of stockholders was giving him a hard time because they were upset that Apple was spending potential profits money on making a data center green, right? And so Tim Cook kind of opened with, well, we want to do the right thing. We want to leave the world a better place, da 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 And so then the guy kept on pushing. And so I think it's the only time actually in recorded history that Tim Cook has lost his temper in public. He's a really very calm sort of, sort of uh, straight shooter. And uh, he basically said, you know, when we work on making our devices accessible to the blind, I don't consider the bloody ROI. I don't consider the return on investment, which I actually immediately had to take back half the bad things I ever said about Apple because that was, <laughs> That was pretty classy. So um, that that was uh, just something that I'd like to bring a little bit of attention to. That even you know, like from the CEO of a very large company, obviously, uh, it, this is a this is a big deal, and it's it's becoming uh, sort of the realm of it's the right thing to do, not we have to do it. And Apple has that amazing. Uh, basically, in a way, a return on their investment uh, in spades as a result of making things like iOS fully accessible and the iPad fully accessible. And it's not always monetarily, but they've gotten a lot of rewards from that in, in other channels. Okay. So, um, this metaphor might be a little bit lost, but uh, uh, I, I thought it might be cute. So the idea here is that, um, and the historians can correct me on this, but uh, lobster used to be served to prisoners. 
and it was considered like this lower end food. Um, and so the juxtaposition here, of course, is uh, the, uh, the you know, lobster that we would give to prisoners versus uh, today, you know, this is like a lobster frittata um, with half a cup of caviar on top of it. This is from the La Meridian Hotel in New York, which is a thousand bucks for that dish. Um, so, you know, somewhat pricey dinner. And, uh, you know, the idea here being that something that previously, the lobster hasn't changed, really. Like the lobster was not just totally horrendous 100 years or 50 years ago and you know amazing now uh, but but the perceptions and everything have so the the thing I'm going for there is essentially this idea that um, you know you can look at things two different ways you can take a look at really novel interfaces some of the ones we're about to start talking about and you can view them immediately as bad things and and sort of this this ah oh, just that's going to be yet another series of headaches from the accessibility point of view and everything or you could really view it as a unique advantage so that's what I'm trying to convey here and I obviously fall into the latter camp all right, so 3D printing. Uh, who here is familiar with 3D printing? Okay, um, so the idea here is obviously that you can, you can, you know, you want stuff, you can make stuff, you can print it in plastic. Um, it, it's, a, it's an additive process. I won't go into the, the technicals of that, but it's a printer that can, that can print real world objects um, made out of, out of plastic and under a certain set of restrictions. What's, what's interesting here is that I actually view this as extremely transformative. It's, it's, it's honestly as transformative, if not more so, than the internet, which is a pretty broad uh, and bold claim, but really somewhat true because it really turns on its head, especially when you take it to some of the logical extremes, uh, this idea of ownership and this idea of capitalism and this idea of I want something and I, I want it now and I can get it by simply transferring information as opposed to having to go somewhere else to get that thing. And so um, there's a lot of sort of economic, sort of real world things there. A piece on your dishwasher breaks, you can print another one, that sort of thing. But there's also a pedagogical or educational based way of looking at this. And that is that, well, if you wanna make a real world representation of something, it's no longer a very difficult thing to do. And so like, for example, I was, um, I was talking to a friend of mine about a concept called a 3D knot. And he's like, all right, dude, imagine a toroid that has no beginning and no end and is twisted on itself like a pretzel and basically can be encapsulated by a sphere. And that's a 3D knot. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I totally know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, it was a really good description, but it was just, you know, it, it's, it's a complicated thing. And so then we were arguing back and forth a little bit in the lab. And then I said, you know, we, we, we have a maker bot like right there. So he went over there, he hit print, and then he dropped this in the palm of my hand. Right? And this all of a sudden is a toroid that has no beginning and no end. You can follow it with your finger, kind of spheroid in a way. It can be encapsulated by a sphere and is kind of twisted like a pretzel. And so that is actually an absolutely good description of it. And, uh, but once I felt it, it was very clear, right? And so for what, 20 cents maybe, not even, in some plastic, you're able to convey this, uh, um, this kind of thing. Obviously the other advantages, and I know we've already got folks here, actually I'd love to talk to them too, that are doing this in like art museums and other things like that where like who cares if it breaks or whatever, right? I mean maybe it's gonna be more than 20 cents in terms of effort and in terms of value, but it's not the original piece and it's, it's able to be touched and it's able to be messed with and interacted with in a real way. So to me it's extremely transformative from just pure accessibility to real world objects point of view. Does that, does that make sense? Um, there are uh, some, some other things as well. So for example, I spent a lot of time refusing to be the stereotypical blind guy who does accessibility stuff. And so uh, in that vein, I did a lot of like bioinformatics research. I can tell you all about like transcription of RNA and things like that. So I did a lot of DNA research and, and you know, all the, that sort of stuff, but I'd never touched this before. And so I had actually like done, you know, like actual work on stuff like this, but it never felt the shape before. I conceptually understood what it was, and I could tell you about base pairs and all those kinds of things and stop codons and all that, but I had never touched this before. And so that was really interesting to me that, again, this took 22 minutes to print, maybe something, whatever. It doesn't, it's not even worth like, you know, whatever. And I, I was able to hold it. And if it breaks, so what? And as a result, like as I've actually gone around uh, when I'm giving talks and stuff and going to different places in the country, uh, sometimes I, I meet with like schools for the blind or whatever, and like when I give this to the kids, they're just blown away by it, right? And what's very interesting actually is that some of them are able to make the conceptual leap from never having touched this before, but intellectually knowing what it is to saying, oh, is that DNA, even though they'd never touched it before, which I thought was actually really fascinating from a pure like inference kind of idea. 
There's other things, by the way, you guys are welcome to come up here afterwards and, and, and I won't bore you too much, but obviously you can think, make things with movable parts, so things like chains. That's really fascinating when you're trying to teach concepts in mechanics or physics. And then you can do things like maps. This is a uh, smaller one, but you can basically then show mountain ranges and things like that. And I've got some other stuff. You can come up and see it. Are folks familiar with the 3D do the 3 -doodler? The what? Oh, okay. So this is a 3D printing pen. So instead of a printer, why not make a pen that can do basically the same thing? So this gets up to 240 to 270 degrees centigrade, depending on whether I put it on PLA versus plastic. I've got rods of plastic that I can stuff in the back of it right here. Power plug is right there. And then this is high extrusion, this is low extrusion, and then you can print and this extrudes kind of like a hot glue gun and you can make stuff. So if you want to play with this, maybe I'll bring it to the bar or something and I've got some plastic <laughs> Mario and uh, you know, by the way, that hurt, like, do not touch that, seriously, that, that, and these are like, these are braille reading fingers, that really hurts. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I just thought this was really amazing because, again, that whole idea of collaboration, remember, like, the difference in touch, where with touch, you could collaborate with a sighted and unsighted colleague with, like, a traditional computer interface, you can't. Similarly here, I can collaborate with a friend of mine, he can draw something, I can feel it, then I can feel what I'm drawing, and I can then work with him, right? I can collaborate with him on that and I can actually be part of that creative process. So to me, that was a really cool, that was a really cool thing. So any questions on, on that stuff? So um, I'm going to give you the short answer now and then like drinks later. So um, the short answer is um, the brilliance of a Muni uh, painting exists in the visual domain. And you have a great deal of neurons in your head dedicated to the processing of visual information, of which the bandwidth is a great deal. So if you look at it from like an information theory point of view, there's just a lot of information going in your head about what you're seeing. And while you do have a lot related to touch and taste and pressure and all those other senses, hearing, um, you know, they don't, they don't really add up to vision and they're, they're different senses. So that whole kind of equitable versus same, you can convey some of it. And yes, you can map color to texture. That's pretty easy. You can do chromatic mapping where brighter gets rough and, and, and darker is dull, for example. But when you talk about the brilliance, to me, that's more of a holistic property. And it's almost like the gestalt of the, of the painting itself. And that's somewhat, I think, more difficult to capture in a purely one-to-one -one mapping for visual to tactile. Um, I think you'd have to do a lot more with combining tactile with audio, as well as maybe different uh, kinds of active things where the tactile is changing texture on the fly. You can do that using modulating electric fields, stuff like that. But um, I can give you a more complicated answer later, but that's just like my IMHO, you know. I, I, I don't have a background in like cognitive psychology or anything, but, but it, it seems to me like that's a, a difficult problem to just say, let's 3D print it. I think you get some of the structure that way, but you don't maybe always get the brilliance that way. So the answer is yes, but you know why I said those things? Because of the tactile properties of the thing, not because of the visual properties that tactile thing represents. Right. So I'm wondering, yeah. you know, particularly about 3D printing, I'm wondering if it's ground noise, if it's silence, uh, I think you have to make up for, spatially, you have to make up for it temporally. So what I mean by that is I think you need to animate the painting. I think you need to take slices of it, and I think you need to have a tactile thing that moves and that vibrates and that has sound in different ways and really make that more of a 3D experience, similar to somebody maybe touching it in real time, uh, as opposed to just making it a static representation. Because the powerful thing about vision and imagery is that you know the whole picture is a thousand words. Well, for tactile, it might need to be more like a movie. It might need to be more uh, dynamic to really convey all of those, those, those things, because you have less bandwidth. But that's just, I mean, again, that's just off the cuff answer to, to that. Uh, any other questions on that? All right. Okay, so touch, we talked about this a little bit, so I won't dwell on it too much, but blind people can't use things with buttons, you know, without buttons, right? Obviously, that's not true. We, we saw how I can use, a, uh, use an iPhone, and we saw what it can, you know, facilitate in terms of 2D uh, interaction, in terms of collaboration, that sort of thing. Um, 
The other thing that I would just stress is, again, the whole inclusion thing. So that thing at Museum of Science, for example, when that fifth grader goes and like deals with that wind interface, she can touch it just as well as her sighted colleagues. When she gets back on the bus, she has the exact same experience to talk about. Maybe her friend will ask her what those sounds were and she can talk about that. But it was using the same thing, not something off to the side. And to me, just kind of not wearing a development hat, but wearing more of a user-centered design hat or whatnot, that's really important. And I think it's a really important thing to concentrate on that at the end of the day, this, all this stuff is, it's not about the sexy tech, it's about the, the people that it actually affects. So something to stress there. Okay, so augmented reality, I generally tend to have a prop for this just for funsies. So I thought the only glasses blind people wear are sunglasses. So there you go, there's my stereotypical. These are not my Ray Charles shades, but they'll do. So there you go. I feel really stereotypical with these on, so I'm gonna take them off. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so there's, there's that, but um, the idea here is, are, are you guys familiar with Google Glass? Okay. And so basically you might be thinking, well, all right, that's awesome if you can see, um, but, and, and that's true, but um, it, it also has some amazing potential if, if done correctly. So, um, you know, for example, all of these augmented reality things like Google Glass, Oculus Rift is another one, they just got acquired by Facebook for two billion, um, is, uh, they all have to know about all the things that I, by a sensory you know, limitation, don't know. So Google Glass has to know about what I would have been seeing if I could see. And so it's a really unique way, if you look at it in a different way, it's actually, it's, 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 it's uniquely uh, positioned to help somebody with a particular sensory deprivation, uh, a particular sensory limitation, because uh, it can know about what you're seeing. And so it can do things like facial detection. Now, we're not gonna get into some of the privacy issues. I'll be happy to talk to you about those afterwards. There've been some pretty, uh, pretty silly decisions made in that space. But the idea here is that if you're at a networking event, right, and you look across the way, you could easily say, oh, that's the director, I should go say hi, or maybe you're at a networking event, that sort of thing. Whereas if you're blind, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, obviously, because you don't have that ability. So for example, if I see some of you in the hallway over the next few days and I ignore you, it's not because I hate you. It's because I didn't know you were there, obviously, right? So it's those sorts of things that things like Google Glass and other augmented reality really can actually help. And again, this is the idea of taking something that is traditionally served in the digital world or thought of to be in the cloud or digital world and really using it to make the real world more accessible and make the real world more usable and more rich. Does that make sense? All right. So this is uh, 3D and natural user interfaces. Um, you guys saw um, a Minority Report, the movie? All right. So remember that interface he was using, like the, 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 the multi-touch sort of like in the air thing, right? So uh, who's heard of uh, Leap Motion? Yeah, all right, so that's what this is right here. So this little guy here is basically that interface. For those who have used it, obviously, you know, it's not as good, um, that was a movie. But, um, but you know, it, it, it is kind of fun. So this little sensor, it's got USB right here, plugs into your computer, it uh, projects an infrared field, very simple, and it gives you hand recognition, and it gives you finger recognition. And so you can do gestures, so you can like put this down, and you can, you know, play a, a fake, uh, you know, instrument, or you can play like air, you know, like air type or whatever, or you can do things like that to control an interface with hand motions. But the other thing you can do is think about what I said about how desktop interfaces were really linear, you know, tab, 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 and down arrow and all that stuff. Whereas this, again, offers you some of the advantages of touch, right? Where you can do, you can address points in space. So if I wanna uh, go through a spreadsheet, all of a sudden I don't have to do like tab, tab, tab with a keyboard or whatnot. Uh, I can actually start maybe having a more linear approach, almost like a fake touch screen, if you will. I can start saying, well, move left by five, six, seven columns at a time, or explore the data in a more kind of hands-on way. And so even though it's a purely visual interface, even though like most of the things for it are, are games and things like that that are totally inaccessible from that point of view, the potential for using something like that to actually make things like data or to make things like complicated interfaces a lot more accessible uh, is, is very much there. So I like to look at that. Um, there's also things like Connect, for example. Same idea, right? So the things behind Connect is it, you know, 
does your, your body, well, if you're blind, you have proprioception, you know, and so you know where your hand is. You know where your hand is related to your other hand. So making commands is very simple. The only part that needs to be accessible is the part on the connect that actually reacts to your motion. So again, you can use this for data exploration. You can use this for communication, automatic sign language recognition, so somebody who's deaf can communicate with somebody who's blind, for example, and things like that. So there's a lot of neat things going on in that space when you basically, again, all you're doing is you're giving the computer one more sense, one more sense, one more sense, touch, then vision, then sound, whatever. And as you do that, you're able to, to make a lot richer environments. Does that, does that make sense? All right. So philosophy towards technology, this is just more of a personal thing, but uh, basically I've sort of been saying it all along, so I, I won't repeat this too much, but the idea that just weaving together all of these things in our environment, you can make these rich interfaces, okay? And uh, the, the real idea here to me is uh, to not shy away from this stuff, but to actually really integrate it. And you're gonna fail, so I mean, it doesn't matter. Like, just fail forward. This idea that, you know, if you're not, if you're not failing, you're not learning, I think is really very much true. So if you're going to do something, just fail the first 20 times so you can get it amazing the 21st time. And that's perfectly fine. Um, a couple of just takeaways here. Um, so, and uh, we might finish a little bit earlier, and I can definitely entertain some questions. But the idea here that uh, essentially think of all audiences, not just the ones you want or the ones that you expect, it's a little bit hard to do. I mean, it, it really is. But once you start getting into this habit, you'd be amazed the things that you can solve at the design stage, as opposed to the implementation stage, or worse, at the remediation stage after it's been implemented and is rolled out on the floor or in front of users' hands, right? And architecture is a pretty good example way easier to add a room to the house when you're dealing with the, the blueprints and you're talking to the architect and nothing's been, no construction's been done versus after people are living there and you have to put, you know, sheets everywhere and you have to, you know, do a bunch of other stuff. It's way more expensive. So if you can include accessibility and universal design into your design process, I promise you it's, it's fractions of pennies on the dollar. Um, and then, in, again, just, uh, essentially viewing these things as opportunities, not, not as challenges. I think that uh, hopefully by some of the examples I've shown you, that's pretty easy to do and sometimes very fun if you're a creative or technically minded. You can really find some really cool opportunities in this space. Uh, and as a result, you're ending up helping a bunch of people in the process, which is always great. Um, and then the other thing with respect to emerging technologies or new technologies is uh, just don't be resistive to them. It really, uh, just by taking these new things and uh, by playing with them, you'd be amazed what you can do. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes it's just sexy and, okay, that was cool, but let's put it away. It's not really actionable. But sometimes it really opens up some doors and some avenues. So I would encourage you to just play with this tech as early as you can get your hands on it. Um, on that note, I'll put up a bunch of contact information. You can reach me on Twitter, my website, um, uh, email me, call me, whatever. And I'd be happy to talk to you about accessibility here over the next couple of days. Just come find me. Um, um, and I'd also be you know, happy to just kind of learn about some of the stuff that you guys are doing. So with that, I will thank you for your time. I'll open it up to questions. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. you do it, but I can do it now. So facial detection, uh, facial recognition and facial detection are two separate problems, right? right so first right. you have to find the faces, then you have to recognize them. Yeah. So give me your Facebook, you know, give me your Facebook OAuth token, and I can go through the pictures of the people in your network, and you can do template-based matching, and you can write an application for things like Google Glass or other open source versions that scans a crowd similar to this one, and that lets you whis and whispers in your ear who that person is, or pops up in front of them as an overlay their LinkedIn ID. Well, so, so the, the, the yeah, I mean, like that stuff is possible. That stuff is, is totally but possible. You would, have, you would have to have an image for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's pretty easy, right? Like yeah. we're connected on various networks. Yeah. 
So that stuff's, that stuff's possible now, but there's a lot of resistance. There's an, there's an artificial privacy question that comes up. So Google claims that this is a violation of privacy. And so my response to that is, it is if you're using the Google Cloud to go track this person down, because that's a little invasive slash big brother. But it's not if it's the picture of my brother that I'm friends with on Facebook. He and I have established a digital relationship because we're friends on a particular network, and I've given this application access to that network. So the privacy concern disappears very rapidly when it's your own network, because those people have already agreed that you can see them. My other argument to you is, I think the privacy issue from an accessibility point of view is completely ridiculous, because if I asked you to find one of the people in this room, you could easily do it, privacy or not, because you just saw them right now but I don't have that same ability. That's all I'm asking the computer to do. So that would be my response on like the privacy point of view. As far as the technical point of view, all of those tools have existed for three or four years. So yeah, we can chat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's one of the things I'd, I'd, I'd love to actually like roll into production because it's, it's really cool, but there's just a lot of you know, concern over it from kind of artificial social memes, but there's, it's technically possible and it's a really useful thing. And not only that, I mean, we're not only talking about somebody who can't see, think of somebody suffering from Alzheimer's, or right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, so a lot of possibilities there. Um, Real-time language translation is the other thing, right? So somebody's talking in Japanese, I don't understand them, but it's popping up a subtitle under their face, right? So all sorts of possibilities there. And that's, that's the advantage to me for augmented reality. It's that stuff. Not necessarily be, being able to play Angry Birds invisibly while I'm at a meeting. Absolutely. And tell you all about it, right? Exactly. So I walk around the museum, and again, that whole thing about it knows where it, it knows what I, I don't, so it'll do gaze tracking on me, right? So it'll know what I'm looking at, and it'll say, you happen to be staring at the Monet. Yeah. Well, that's the happening in the market that we're about. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So. But again, remember with smartphone, you've got a massive aiming problem, right? right? Yeah. Whereas yeah. even someone who's blind, stereoscopic hearing allows them, you know, stereo hearing lets them aim correctly just naturally, like I'm looking at you right now, or you know, at least faking it okay, right? Okay. <laughs> I have a question that um, I haven't really thought about yet, so I'll just say go, go for it. Um, when, when you watch films, uh, mm -hmm. there's often when someone's using a computer, mm -hmm. especially with like a spy movie or something, yeah. they, they make all kinds of sounds. Like sure, sounds, absolutely. Right, and yeah. um, Yes. With, with audio. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that helping in any way? It can, yes. Uh, and are there audio designers who are working on those kinds of um, audio representations or visual interfaces on the right tracks? Or okay, well, the, the answer to that part is what audio designers that are working on right. those kinds. So, so that's a little bit of that. But, um, there are folks who incorporate, so like a lot of with, with my clients, whenever it's a museum that wants to roll out a, a touchscreen interface or something like that, an eye screen interface, I always have them put in sounds, okay? Those sounds, you heard some of them on the iPhone, remember it was clicking as I was going through stuff? So the thing is, it takes you several hundred milliseconds, right? I don't know what the latest numbers are, two, three hundred milliseconds, to pro begin processing speech, okay? It only takes you about, what, 30, 50 milliseconds to process Right? So the thing is that if I give you clicks, I can let you skip through six icons by just going click, 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 as opposed to Amazon, YouTube, contacts, photos, list. Right? So those are very big you know, semantic what, chunks. What about tones? So tones are fine. So now we're getting into something called ear cons. Mm -hmm. And uh, ear cons are kind of the idea that you can map semantically uh, not only the fact that you landed on an icon, but what the icon is based on the tone. The problem there is discovery. So how do you know that do 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 means what it means, right? right? So well, that's, it has, it has to be some standard, right? And that doesn't exist. Right. Now certain things exist, right? Bonk, like ding, right. ding, kind of means like an, a bad thing or an right. end of something, or, or like, uh, you know, ding, 
kind of means more of a confirmation. There's certain idioms that we've come up with, but not to the point of making them rich, like you're in a list or you're in a menu. That the, there are some, but they all have different ones. So I can point you to paper after paper, but they all come up with their own ever since the 80s. Yeah, which is fine because basically they haven't really perfected the idea of transferring it you know, effectively. The, the major problem has to do with yeah, I mean, it's just like, like look, you gotta, you got to standardize on something, and then you got to convey it to all the users, and then no, no one's going to agree. So oftentimes, this is done by discovery. Uh, my, my Twitter client plays a sound that is different for each thing. So when I get a DM, it's different than a mention. It's different than a favorite. It's different than a retweet or something in my home buffer, which I usually mute. Okay, so I have all those suite of sounds. But you know what I did? I went through the little audio thing in the, in the Twitter application, and I learned all those sounds. Yeah. And now they're meaningful to me, but so they're they're perfect, they're wonderful. But it's because I had to actively go discover them. Yeah, so they weren't native, and I think that's okay because if you think about it, visually you have to sometimes do that too. What does that icon mean? So you might run your mouse over it. Yeah, the colors can be different. The the the, the face of the font can be different and mean different. Yeah, absolutely. They had a little audio tutorial where they yeah. just have a list box and they have a play button. Yeah. And then the, in the list box, it says retweet, uh, follow, unfollow, uh, you know. Well, so that wasn't Twitter. That was a custom Twitter client, to right. be fair. Yeah. But, but yes, they, they, because they are trying to be a very accessible Twitter yeah. client, that was one of their goals. Uh, the, uh, the iPhone one that I use is called Twitterific. Yeah. It doesn't actually do that. Okay. It doesn't have that tutorial. But it does have different sounds. So it has different sounds, but I, I discovered them just through, oh, that's, every time she says mention, that sound plays. Every time she says direct message or message from, that sound plays. So I learned them naturally. Right. And that's, I have two great questions. There are two different parts of the learning aspect. Yep. So one of them really getting the Explicit so versus it. implicit. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, explicit is going to reach more users, but you're going to require them to go through that step. Implicit is one of those things that you're just hoping kind of pervasively gets there. No, I was just, when I was doing the rotor, the alert, the push notifications came in, and that's why you heard the Twitterific banner at the top, because I, totally yeah, no, that would be amazing, but you can't put applications in that, but that would just automatically read, so if I didn't have my phone on silent right now, right. it would just be reading me tweets as they come because in. Because that application is open, or because you have the notification? No, because it's just going to pop up a notification, and because okay. I have voiceover on, yeah, it yeah. will read any notification that comes in on the phone. And that's a result of that. And by the way, that is actually a point of view to keep in mind, so the whole universal design thing, that they didn't do anything specific to make those read automatically. They followed a proper, just regular notification, and then the screen reader took care of it, because they followed standards. So that's a really good point. Anything else? depends on what you're doing. So I mean, I was talking about the loop motion, right? And about data exploration. But you know, the other thing is, well, it was Tom Cruise, right? And one of the things he said was after about the 10th take, he felt like his arms were about to fall off. And so it's an important, I mean, it's called gorilla arm, you know, on glass screens and stuff. So it's, a, it's an important thing to keep in mind that uh, you really have to be cognizant of the modality you're using, what, what the affordances are in terms of physical. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, essentially, the idea there is that, um, I think that 3D has some really rich opportunities, but I also think people tend to stray towards it just as a it's sexy sort of solution. And so as a result, it's sometimes really noisy. Um, you don't need 3D to convey a menu. It's, it's fine in 2D, it's perfectly okay. Uh, on the other hand, 3D is really great for exploring a room or exploring maybe a map that has altitude portions to it, like slices and things like that. So it depends on your data. I think it really depends on your underlying data. And it also depends on your interface. So 3D for someone who's blind or in doing it in an eyes-free way, it's very different than 3D for someone who can see and can take advantage of things like parallax and uh, 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 perspective and occlusion and things like that. So yeah, it really depends on the data and the presentation technique.
and the interaction technique, what they can do, by the way, I, I forgot to mention that. So not only what you're doing as a display to the user, whether it's tactile, touch screen, whatever, it's what they're able to do to manipulate that 3D environment. Are they able to twirl in this direction, like pitch and yaw, or are they only able to navigate with the arrow keys, but you've also given them a Z axis? What, what is the way you've given them that allows them to understand that 3D? So one of the cool things about, like for example, combining something like the wave motion with something like let's say this was 3D printed was the idea that proprioception lets me, I know the orientation of this as I'm turning it, and then if this was able to track that, I could be touching this as I'm interacting with this. So now I've got knowledge about the orientation of this thing. That's implicit knowledge. The computer doesn't have to tell me that, I can touch it. But by making these actions, I can explicitly send commands to this in a 3D way, right? So you have to be kind of clever about how you think about those interfaces. And not always rely on one modality to convey the information. Sometimes just their touching it is good enough. Right. Anything else? I'm just gonna go ahead and like unplug some stuff. But feel free to, to chime in. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, not a problem. So buses leave at six, is that right? Okay. okay. I'm just gonna head over to the elevator, so if you don't mind, I'll walk over there with you. Uh, yeah, hey, I, 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 I noticed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, so I'm do we're doing plan for that with Corey? I well so he wants to do the crit, right? And so yeah. like uh he he owes me content. <laughs> so there's that. Yes. Uh, I was trying I'm, to squeeze information out of him and uh, right. I think it's coming together. To dynamically at runtime yeah. do basically what I just did here with the web, I guess portion of the website, go right. over said content and like be the be the product user or something. Yes. Okay. I think usability, you're going to do the usability testing at okay. 90 miles per hour the way yeah. you described that's it. Fine. <laughs> but yeah. I think that's really apt. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Abby and my team have got two others, and we're going to do a 20, 30 minute intro, which is going to focus on smartphones. Yeah, I think that's fine. I mean, I, let me know if you want me to try then. Let me know if you yeah. want me to. You know well, what I mean? Like, it's so funny. funny. It's very so familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk about that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing a demo of voiceover, and I'm like, dang it, he explained it. This yeah. is <laughs> Days I've gotten 150, okay. but really it, it starts peaking. Yeah. yeah, at the 30, 40, 50. Um, yeah. It really depends. <laughs> on, about yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's the goal is obviously higher, but right. it's uh, it's a little hard. Um, yeah. 
if you do another survey, there are mechanisms for getting that out there. I, I know some folks that can yeah. help s spread that to yeah. various audiences. Well, we're going to keep this one until the end of May. Okay. So if you take a look at it. It's the beginning of May. Oh, and then I said it by where I was on the 6th of yeah. May. Well, if it's the end of May, then certain main newsletters that go out can right. be included. So let, them, let them know. Yeah. Yeah. We're extending it one more time. I mean, it's completely it's arbitrary. It's arbitrary yeah. anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I never committed it in the beginning. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because it's one of the things that I want to see is that specifically with the no longer individual spaces, some of the names start fairly small in the next recession where it's going to be far too long. Yeah, that was a that's a problem. That's a serious, serious problem. It is a serious problem, and that's one of the things where that's a big learning curve for me. Like, just split it up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. unfortunately, you have to ask some of your bases again. Yeah, but, but I think also we were trying to tackle like almost too large things. an audience and too many things in yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, that's we're aiming not just at people with vision impairment and, right. and who are people who are blind or have low vision, but also pr pretty much anybody who identifies as having any disability. Right, right. and that's right. that's going to be this. <laughs> yeah. We aimed too high. Yes. That's a little. That's a little too inclusive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 At least from a statistics point of view, because I think uh, we're, we're unfortunately what's going to happen is it's going to come out. Right. And you're just not going to be able to sing to the moon. Right. Um, well, and I've tried to extract some things and it's benefit like very, nice. like, very, you know, the, just the high level thing that I thought was going to make some things out that this audience would be interested in. And some of the more granular stuff you might have to go back to to get that out. But that was also, we did all of that back in like November, Six or seven, December. Yeah. And, like, yeah, we've done a lot more mm -hmm. since then. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would. Nancy yeah. was talking about having me talk about CSUN a little bit. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if that's. I, I mean, I'll talk I to you. I mentioned it, yeah. but I know you did the. I, you know, I was stopping yeah, yeah. CSUN, and so as soon as the, the, the stuff came out about it, I was taking a look. Um, yeah. You know, I know you did a presentation there, and I was. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I was just going to include some of the. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Because I really think you might want to spend more time on this other stuff. Yeah. Um, Simply because the takeaways for CSUN are not worth spending ten minutes. They're very broad. Yeah, they're yeah. Very, they're very broad and, and if I specific. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, I was like, well, I did like four or five presentations there. I was like, well, like you know, math accessibility. Well, I mean, I can relate that to museums, but honestly, for the right. one person here that that might intersect with, they can go either way. Yeah. So. Well, you might have some sort of space then on what we put together, and that might be helpful to consider yeah. that exactly. for Friday, sure. and then you know, email me or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we should talk. But so I mean, they, they want to go to these conferences. The major or speaking, even when I met like various jobs, I know. I, and I never know who the hell I'm talking you, you think to. you want it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I yeah, it's it's a big deal. Yeah. Um, but yeah. there's a, on a lot of the standard platforms. Unfortunately, there's this artificial privacy concern, which is right. really ridiculous. It's silly. It's really silly. I mean, I I, mean, I used to do like privacy and law. I was thinking of going and picking up a JD and everything. There's not a privacy issue here, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. privacy is when you're scanning Gmail. Like, right. go, go concentrate on that. Not, yeah. you know, Thank you. people's <laughs> known network. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, 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 that's unfortunate, but. Well, if you ever make one and you need these resources. Yeah, testers. I really wanted to. I, I need to, like, put together the resources to, to do this thing. But, I mean, it's it's just some facial detection and recognition. And yeah. Yeah. Better and better template mapping, you know, just, just yeah. grabbing better and better algorithms to do the, oh, there's 20 faces in front of me. Oh, there's one face in front right, of me. Right, right, that right, right. That kind of stuff. Yeah. But the lookup, no stuff. I'm not writing that. Yeah. Somebody's already coded it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, even something like, so, you know, iPhoto, photo oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like their faces thing, yeah. learns based on when you tell it, like yeah. this pattern of light and dark yes. is, is my niece. Yes. Like yeah. I've had iPhoto identify for me my niece at two years old and my niece at 16. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, and which is pretty, uh, you know. It's pretty if cool. If it can already do that. Yeah, then, exactly. You know. I know. And you know, it does that for um, Eyes Free uh, too, right? When I uh, look uh, at my photos. The new camera yeah, thing? Yeah. Uh, uh, it tells me how many faces are in the frame. Yeah, it tells and you then, if the picture is blurry. Yeah, it tells you if it's that. blurry or not. Yeah, it's really cool. You, you you nearly blew my mind, though, when I was thinking, oh my god, he's got Twitterific. In yeah, I know. <laughs> and I immediately <laughs> I downloaded Twitterific. I could, I and could then do. I was looking in the road and going, how did he do that? Did he hack yeah. it? Did he jailbreak yeah. it? Like, I could. If I jailbroke it, I could probably get it in there. But sadly, no. But you don't need it in there anyway. No, it's true. 